here with the dog event. You are all in store for a really amazing evening tonight. And I just want to thank all of our wonderful patients for making it out here and uh, their amazing guests as well. Uh, so what we're going to do tonight is Dr. Arbeck will speak in just a moment and then we'll uh, have dinner, we'll give away some prizes, and it's going to be a fun night. Uh, I want to acknowledge our amazing staff that we have over here. We've got Mary right over here, Stephanie, Katie, and uh, so I would like to introduce you all to uh, Dr. Larry Arbeitman. He is uh, from Manalpa, New Jersey. He attended uh, University of Maryland uh, Life University and received his doctorate in Logan College of Chiropractic. He is the founder of Upper Cervical Chiropractic of Monmouth, located in Marlboro. He uh, has overseen over 180,000 patient visits over the past 14 years. He has become well respected within our profession and more specifically the Upper Cervical Specialty. He has routinely uh, taught at various Upper Cervical Seminars. He even founded a, um, a mentoring program for chiropractic students. Uh, so he has also traveled across the country teaching to colleagues, students, and the general public. And so what he's gonna do tonight is he's gonna highlight some general key points from his book, The Gift of Hope, The Path to Healing Through Upper Cervical Care. So it is my great honor to introduce my colleague, mentor, and good friend, Dr. Larry Arbutt.
to see what I saw in the last 16 years. I think you'd be up here speaking, and there'll be a couple people up here speaking. You may be thinking, why a chiropractor? Why a dinner? Why is this happening? Why is he doing this? And the truth is, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that we save lives in our office with the chiropractic adjustment. And you may be thinking, hmm, that's kind of a bold statement. I just met this guy, and he's telling me he saves lives with chiropractic. That's ridiculous. I mean, it's not like if there's an accident, God forbid, out of 33 here, and someone gets thrown from their car, you're going to bring them in here, and I'm going to you know, do an adjustment on the side of their neck, and we're going to stop the bleeding. It's not emergency medicine. We need those doctors, too. We save lives in a very different way. Lots of times, by the time people meet us, they're at the end of their rope. They've been everywhere, they've tried everything, they've exhausted a lot of options, traditional and maybe more alternative. And whatever it is that their health challenge is, it's greatly interfering with their quality of life. Their ability to connect with their spouse or their children or work or earn, or how they show up with their emotions on a day-to-day -day basis. They're a shell of who they once were. And we've seen people restore their lives. And there was a there was a there was a young woman, for those of you who have um, you know heard me speak before, I, I always tell the story at every time every time I lecture because it absolutely changed my life. I believe none of us would be in this room right now if I didn't meet Stephanie. Not that great Stephanie, a different Stephanie. <laughs> Um, Stephanie was a gymnast at Friel Township High School. This is probably about 12 or 13 years ago. I was a new practitioner, and I, I was so new, I think I answered the phone when her mom called the office. That's how new I was. And um, she told, begins telling me the story about how her daughter was at the movies with her girlfriends, and she went paralyzed. Like, she couldn't move in the chair at the movie, in the seat of the movie theater. And they rushed her up to Rock Robert Wood Johnson and they ran the battery of tests and they came back with a diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. The diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome is really serious because most of the time it ends up leading to, it's almost like ALS, it leads to respiratory failure and death. And Stephanie didn't end up having Guillain-Barre syndrome. The diagnosis was wrong as sometimes they are. And she, was, she got the movement back in her body, but she was left with such bad chronic pain and fatigue that she had to be homeschooled. She was off the gymnastics team. She had no quality of life with her friends. She was just existing. Mom, she was, mom was now the caregiver, and she was 15 years old at the time. And so, as a last resort, because they had gone up to the biggest and best on Park Avenue, they went down to CHOP, the pediatrician, the infectious disease doctor, the rheumatologist, finally the doctor said, it's in her head, take her to a psychiatrist. And, and that's, that's, that was what their answer was. Because instead of saying, I don't know. Um, so Pat, the mother of Stephanie, is at a dinner just like this. There's probably about 120 people in the room. And there was not a dry eye in the room. Does anybody at that dinner? There, you were at the dinner, Holly? So she goes on to tell the story, and so Stephanie gets under care, we start taking care of Stephanie, and we watch Stephanie's health restore. Now, it wasn't like I adjusted Stephanie and she did a backflip out of the office. Because think about it, if you didn't water your grass, and it's like the middle of August and it's brown, and you put the sprinkler on, does it just go green and growing? No. First, like, it gets a little tint of yellow back into it. Then the yellow turns to a light green. Then the wilt comes out. Then the light green turns to dark green, and then it goes green and growing. And that's really how healing happens. So healing is not an event. It's a process. Just, but I got a secret for you. So is sickness and illness. That was a process, too. Unless it's a trauma. And so we started taking care of Stephanie, and we started seeing her make breakthroughs. Like, I remember she went back um, to school, and then she went back into the gym to watch her friends. And then I remember when she had her first party that she was able to go to. And then she started to tumble. And I'll never forget the day she came into the office. The front door opened up, and she said, Dr. Larry, I did giants. Who knows what giants are? Giants are when they swing all around the uneven bar. To this day now, Stephanie now lives in Ho uh, Hoboke, Jersey City, and she drives down every few weeks for her maintenance care. 
And I'll never forget the time where Stephanie came down to Mama County, picked up her wedding dress, got her adjustment, and went off to get married. <laughs> she is now a speech pathologist. She went through college at Seton Hall, and um, it's a life saver. Because what happens? Does she end up getting back to school, getting an education, uh, becoming a wife one day if she wants to have children? And that's what motivates me personally each and every day to do what we do. It's a mission-based, purpose-based work. This is why we put together an event like this. Because I don't know, maybe tonight's event isn't for you. Maybe it's for the Stephanie in your life who's not here right now. So I remember how many more Stephanie's, and I've got hundreds of these stories. Just go on our website, read them, they're amazing. Hundreds of these stories. And I think about how many people fall through the cracks. There's another way that we save lives, and this is serious. We'll have some fun, I promise. I got some bad dad jokes. <laughs> but we gotta be serious for a second because we're talking about health. And this is a big issue, and I've been speaking about it for years. You ever hear the word opioid? 183,000 Americans have died in the last 15 years from prescribed, not street, prescribed opioids that they got at Walgreens or CVS from the doctor. 183,000 is three times the amount of people that died in Vietnam. It's 175 people a day. So 175 people die today, and another 175 will die tomorrow, and then again on Thursday, and then again on Friday, and that's what moving to an airplane. Just going down, going down. And if an airplane went down, and it's a big tragedy, it would be all over the news. I mean, if four people contract measles, it's an epidemic. This is an epidemic. It's called an opioid epidemic. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is we take care of hundreds of patients in our practice. We don't have anybody taking opioids right now in our practice. And I'm aware of it, at least. Now we've had patients come in on opioids and we celebrate when they're able to get off of them with their doctor, of course. I believe that some of our patients would have been on that trajectory had they not gotten into the practice. But 14 years later, zero, zero. And everybody, if you know somebody who has suffered as a result of the opioid epidemic, just raise your hand. And what happens when they can no longer get opioids is they move into something called heroin. So it's a big problem. And it's another way that we save lives. And so in the next 20 minutes or so, we're gonna talk about how Stephanie healed, how the body heals, um, and we're gonna come full circle. So I started out um, this conversation by asking everybody if they wanted to be healthy and happy, and of course, naturally, everybody's hands go up. I have another question for you. How many people in here are healthier today than they were five years ago? That's awesome, that's awesome. How many people in here believe it's possible to be healthier five years from now than you are today? That's awesome belief too. Those beliefs are critical because believe it or not, you are, we are, where we are with our health to a large part based on what we believe. Because believe it or not, we take actions based on the things we either consciously or unconsciously believe. And if you have a belief that as you get older and older, you get sicker and sicker and need more and more interventions and more and more doctors and believe everything on age, like, you're going there. Like, that's the trajectory you've set your mind on. But if you have a belief that so many of you do, that things can be better than they are today, that's powerful belief and trajectory you put your mind on too. And I get it, I get it, bad things happen to good people, I get that. And I know that there's a counterexample for this. But I promise you, you make different decisions in your day-to-day -day actions based on that belief that you have or don't have. For those of you who have regained health over the past five years, if I had asked you, what did you do to change your health? And I'm not gonna put any of you on the spot. Most of the time what I hear is, I lost 20 pounds, I finally started working out with a personal trainer, I changed my nutrition, I got off of gluten, I quit smoking, I got him out of my life. <laughs> it's usually some sort of lifestyle change. It's not, 
I found this great medicine, or I had this surgery, or I got this great doctor. It's tr critically, someone changes something on the inside, and then it changes their outside world. But we're trained, when things are going well, we look in the mirror and we go, nice job, self. But when things aren't going so well, we tend to look outside and look for the reason. And I promise you, I've watched a lot of people regain their health and change, do the 180. It's always, always an inside out process. It's kind of like a hot air balloon. People are looking to add on, like, oh my God, I got this problem. I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. I'll tell you, you got to start thinking, what do I got to get rid of? What do I got to get rid of? What do I have to shed? And then the, the, the balloon goes up. If it were to get, if the thermostat died in this moment, and it would start to get really like clammy in here, like really uncomfortable, it's weird. Like we wouldn't look outside and blame the weather. We would say, huh, this room is no longer self-regulating itself the way that it once did. And we would check, the first thing we would do is we'd go to the thermostat and you know, see if the buttons work. How come we don't do that with our body? Do you know what the thermostat is in your body that's responsible for its response to the outside world? We're going to talk about that. So I asked how many people want to be healthy and happy, and everybody raised their hands, except that I think it was one person, but you probably just didn't hear me. <laughs> how do you know if you're healthy? How do you know if you're healthy? You all want it. It's your most prized possession. You would give up everything for your health. You would give up your house for your health. Your, your biggest asset. In fact, if you had the Mega Millions ticket, you'd give up that too, because what good would it be if you didn't have your health? Your health affects everything in your life. It affects your intellectual, it affects your emotional, it affects your relationships, it affects your ability to work, it affects your purpose, it affects your quality of life. What is it? How do you know if you have it? How do you know if you're healthy? You may want to take a stab at that. This is the English speaking room, right? <laughs> I wanted to make sure I came to the right room tonight. <laughs> Can I have a couple of books, Mayor? Um, you just have them right here. Well, I'll tell you. And not because I know what health is. I read it in the dictionary. According to Dorland's Medical Dictionary, health is a complete state of mental, physical, and social well-being. And not merely the absence of disease and or infirmity. By a show of hands, how many people have a complete state of mental, physical, and social well-being? Awesome, 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 awesome. You lie about other things too. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Typically when I ask that question, how do you know if you're healthy, people will say, um, excuse me, sir, do you mind turning the air down a little bit? I can tell some of the women are chilly. Thank you. Their thermostats inside are working, so that's good. <laughs> Typically, if I ask a room, how do you know if you're healthy, this is what I hear. Dr. Larry, if I feel good, I'm healthy. How do you like that for definition? Feeling good? <laughs> Anna, Anna agrees, Carol agrees. I'm going to tell you that how you feel, I want to feel good. I want you to feel good. I want my family to feel good. I want my, parents, my patients to feel good and my parents to feel good. But I'll tell you that nothing to do with your health. Zero. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Think about it. Cancer, heart disease, diabetes, strokes, hypertension, atherosclerosis, osteoporosis. These are terrible conditions. And these people feel fine. They feel good until they get a test that tells them, you should be feeling pretty bad soon. <coughs> Right? We all know somebody who felt good and found out something really bad. And 40% of the time, what's the first symptom of heart disease? No, death. 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 40% of the time. I watched a man in a softball game last month that I was playing in throw a pitch, go down, and die. Brought him back to life with compressions, and he lives to tell the story. He felt so good that day. I felt he felt so good he went to pitch. Mm -hmm. So just looking at whether or not you feel good to determine whether or not you're healthy is definitely an incomplete strategy. But one that we've been duped or sold, right? Like remember when there were commercials on TV and the woman would take the Allegra 
And I, I don't, I'm not pro-medicine or anti-medicine. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't know anything about medicine. I don't have a horse in that race. But she would take the Allegra and she would run through the fields, right? Or there's, or there's the, the big billboard on the turnpike of the, of the Advil, right? And, we, and, and so we're, we're told that when something is wrong, we take something and it makes us feel better and then we have our health back. And I'll tell you that a million Americans are going to die this year of heart disease, and they're not dying because they forgot to take their medicine. They're dying on their medicine. They're dying with regulated. It's kind of like a beach ball. We're just pushing all the physiology into where we, where we want it to be, and it's called polypharmacy. 50% of Americans over 50 or 5 grow to more. And maybe they're necessary to keep you or someone you love alive, so don't stop taking them. <laughs> But it gives the false impression that my blood work came back right, so I'm good, I'm healthy. It gives the false impression that you regained your health. The medical profession is not healthcare, it's sick care. How many of you wake up tomorrow feeling good and call your doctor and say, can I come in? They're gonna laugh you off the phone. In fact, ladies, if you go for a mammography, or men, you go for a prostate exam, and God willing, God willing, it comes back negative. There's nothing there, there's no cancer. What do they say? Come back in a year or two and we'll see if you have cancer. It's really easy to find disease. A really good doctor can help their patients find health. They're two totally different things. The absence of disease is not health. Health is a complete state of mental, physical, and social well-being and not really the absence of disease and your infirmity according to do in the medical dictionary. So it's kind of like this definition of like education. We all have a level of education that's better than, larger than most of the people on the planet. Could we all be a little smarter than we are today? Absolutely. When are you done working on your intelligence? Never, hopefully. When are you done working on your health? Health is not a destination. It's a process, and it's in levels. We all have a greater level of health than people in ICU right now. But everybody in this room can improve where they are with their health. Everybody in this room can improve where they are with their health. And we're going to give you some strategies to talk about that. So if health isn't how we feel, and health is about this complete mental, physical, and social well-being, according to Webster, the definition is when all of your organs are functioning at 100%, 100% of the time. So we can't do anything about organs that are no longer with you. We can't do anything about the time that is gone, but the key to the definition of health is one word, function. When your body is doing what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it, it's working well. When the blood pressure goes up and it comes back down, when the sugar goes up and it comes down, when the libido goes down and it comes back up, when the thyroid goes down and it comes back up, this is called homeodynamics. But when it gets out of balance, when it gets out of balance, we have a condition. And so, what system of the body is responsible for the function of the body? Endocrine system. Anybody else want to take a stab? The brain. The brain. Thank you, by the way. Because the brain and the endocrine system, the brain and the hormones, the nervous system and the endocrine system are really the same system. Medicine is compartmentalized, but it's neuroendocrinology. Your pituitary gland, which is your master gland, ladies that control all your hormones that are um, and gentlemen too, um, sits at the base of your brain, in your thalamus. Your brain is telling your body how much thyroid hormone to produce. Your brain and your spinal cord run your body. Everything you hear, smell, taste, touch, your, everything you perceive in your environment is filtered through your nervous system. Your eyes are actually an extension of your brain. It's the only piece of your nervous system that you can actually see from the outside of your body. Your nervous system, according to Gray's Anatomy, controls every organ, cell, and tissue of the body all the time. Not some all the time, not all some of the time, all, all the time. In fact, if I took, if I took Dr. Lincoln and I took all of his skin away, and I took all of his muscles away, and there's a lot of them there, and we took his bones off, you would still see the outline of Dr. Lincoln standing there because you can see all the nerves. In fact, if you don't believe me, just take your fork and start poking it around. Anywhere you feel the fork is a nerve. And here's the secret. Only 10% of your nerves do you actually feel, actually reach your consciousness. 
90% of our nervous system we can't even feel. It's operating independent of us. Could you imagine, Ken, if you were to tell your heart to beat? Right? Or your stomach to stomach, or your spleen to spleen. It's all happening automatically through the central nervous system. Your blood pressure, your thyroid, your stomach, your sleep wake cycles, your stress response. Your autonomic nervous system allows you to adapt to the environment. And there's two parts to your autonomic nervous system. You've got the fight or flight, and you've got the feed and the heal and repair part. Now, as a society, do you think we're getting healthier or sicker? Sure. According to uh, uh, the CDC, 90% of chronic illness in this country is related to unchecked stress. Relentless stress. Because if you think about it, is it okay if I take my jacket off? Just my jacket. <laughs> if there was somebody released a tiger into the room, from the kitchen. And all of a sudden, there's a tiger there. Just picture this with me. There's a tiger there. What's going to happen? Adrenaline's going to kick in. Muscles are going to start to tighten. Our focus and our energy is going to get real narrow. What's going to happen to our digestive system? Is it going to turn on or shut off? <laughs> it's going to let go and then it's going to shut down. Right? Because that's what it's going to do in those instances. What's going to happen to your blood pressure when there's a tiger there? It's going to go up or down. Uh, What's going to happen to your blood sugar? It's going to go up or down. What's going to happen to your triglycerides? It's going to go up or down. What's going to happen to your thyroid gland? It's going to go down or up. It's going to go down. What's going to happen to your libido? Do you need libido when there's a tiger in the room? Even the men, it goes down, okay? Can you see what I'm saying? All of the chronic conditions that are being treated in our country are normal stress physiology. The difference is the tiger doesn't go away. It's there when you go to sleep, when you wake up, when you look at your phone, when you listen to the news. There's a lot of stress. I don't remember growing up like it being like this. Do you guys? <laughs> there's stress. Nobody has stress, right? Because none of us have physical stress. We all work out five to seven days a week. We have a Pilates reformer in our living room. We have perfect alignment. We never look at our cell phone or our technology. And we have a trainer named Wolf. None of you have any chemical stress because we live in the great state of New Jersey with the clean New Jersey air and we drink the clean New Jersey water and we're never exposed to any insecticides, pesticides, or chemicals prescribed or not prescribed. Emotional stress, that's the third type. None of us have any emotional stress, right? Are you married? Do you have kids? And finances and mortgages. And so you can see that these things put the body into a state of fight or flight. And left unchecked, it decreases the body's ability to adapt, function, and heal. And it's usually a process. It's usually a process. It's like you, all of a sudden, it's like someone put the dimmer switch down on your body, and you look back and you go, man, I just don't move the way I used to move. I just don't heal the way that I, that I used to heal. Things just happen and they don't get better on their own. It must be because I'm getting older. Thank you. You, you have that belief system, then, if you're able to answer it like that. That's OK. It's, just, it's part of our culture. It's part of our culture. I'm going to tell you that's not true. We've got amazing patients in their 70s and 80s that are super highly active. And unfortunately, I have, we have patients in their 20s and 30s that really struggle. They can't even work. So it can't all be age and genetics, right? There has to be a lifestyle component. The chiropractic adjustment, specifically the upper cervical adjustment, is one of the safest, gentlest, and most effective ways of shutting off the fight or flight response and turning on the rest, heal, and repair response. Most patients, after you get adjusted, and most of you will nod your head, you get up onto the, to the scales and you go, and that's just we downshifted. It works incredibly well with children. Lots of times children now are, well, 20% of children in high school boys are on some sort of uh, ADHD medication. One in five children have a mental health diagnosis now in our country. One in 28 boys in New Jersey are autistic or have some sort of sensory issue. One in 10 have asthma. One in 10 
have cirrhosis or toxicity of the liver. Choke. It's the sickest generation. It's a culmination of too much stress for their nervous systems to adapt. So I've been fortunate enough to be witness to a lot of people healing from various amount, different types of conditions uh, over the last 16 years. And I will tell you, I've never, ever, ever, ever healed anybody of anything. I'm not that smart, I'm not that talented. The definition of healer is the person who's next to the body or with the person at the time that they heal. Even the best surgeons in the world know this. If they do a surgery and they plate, they screw and uh, a broken arm together or or God willing, you know, let's say they do a brain surgery, what do they say? The surgery went well, but now we have to see how the body heals. The adjustment went well, that's all I can do, but now we have to see how the body heals. So we talked about healing being an inside out process. Your nervous system controls and coordinates your entire body. Your body, believe it or not, believe it or not, here's a belief system to install, is self-regulating, meaning it regulates itself like a thermostat, and self-healing. How many people have ever cut their skin? Like bad, like right? Is the cut still there? What healed it? Um, the, the doctor? The band-aid? No, 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 the Neosporin, like in the commercial, right? You put it on and it just goes away. The body, the body can heal. The healing is a universal law. What's a universal law, Dr. Larry? A universal law is a law anywhere in the world, whether you believe in it or not. Gravity is an example of a universal law. If we went to the top of this building, whether you believe in gravity or not, if you jump, you're gonna fall. And if you go over to New Zealand and you do it there, you're gonna fall there too. Maybe in the opposite direction, but you're gonna fall. <laughs> So Dr. Larry, if healing is a universal law, then why are, am I, or somebody I know, or so many people not healing or suffering? Why aren't these keys falling? Can you interfere, I'm holding it, can you interfere with the law of gravity? How does a plane get from here to San Francisco? Who interfere with the law of gravity? Who gets there? So you can interfere with your body's innate ability to heal. I mean, think about it. Human beings have been on the planet for thousands of years. Before there were any chiropractors, before there were any medical doctors, before there were any acupuncturists, before there was a Dr. Oz, human beings had the ability to survive and heal. They lived very differently, too for the purpose of survival and procreation. Has human life changed quite a bit in the last 100 years, right? How about the last 15 years? Are there things in our environment, in our lives, that are interfering with our body's ability to heal? Start to the nest and it ends with the nest, it's called stress. And in chiropractic, we call that stress a subluxation. Can you guys humor me, because we're on video here? Can you all just repeat the word subluxation? How many people have heard that word before? You remember there was a time where we didn't know the word cholesterol, and now we all know our number, right? <laughs> so subluxation is the chiropractic $5 word for stress. And it basically means that there is more stress in the nervous system that the body can actually handle, and it short circuits. Nine out of 10 times, the body can self-adapt. Who was I having that conversation with today? Was it you being somebody that's here I was having that conversation with where we can be a branch that bends but then bounces back, like, like almost like a bonsai, right? But bounces back. Or we can be real brittle and every time something comes on us, we break. So we want to be able to adapt. <coughs> so this is the way that upper cervical works, because a lot of you um, who are new to our practice are still trying to understand what's actually happening when you work behind my ear and you do this upper cervical adjustment. And for those of you who are guests who were told, no, 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 this isn't one of those chiropractors that crack your neck. You got, they do something very different. I can't explain it, but they'll explain it. <laughs> That's my job tonight. And so, um, if there's 68,000 chiropractors, give or take one or two, okay? Um, there's only about 800 chiropractors in the world that specialize in upper cervical chiropractic. 
So just like with martial arts, there's lots of different methodologies. Just like in medicine, there's lots of different kind of doctors. Just like in law, there's lots of different types of attorneys. In chiropractic, there's lots of different chiropractic approaches. I chose, or I didn't choose anything, <laughs> it found me, become a chiropractor because I grew up, like I said, in Manalvin in the 90s, and I played football for the Manalvin Braves. And back in the 90s, we were taught to hit with our heads. Oh. Who played football 90s or before? Were you, <laughs> you were a coach. Right? We were taught, put your face mask in their numbers. And whoever had more scuffs on their helmet got more playing time. And so when I got to college, University of Maryland, I couldn't turn my neck. I was having digestive and immune issues. And I went off to become a chiropractor because I was attracted to this philosophy that you can help people change their lives without putting anything in or taking anything out of the body. And I went down to Atlanta, this is back in 1999, and I was getting adjusted by my first quarter, first trimester um, professor, chiropractor. Uh, I was going to his office three days a week, and I wasn't getting well. I saw no change, and I thought this was BS. I remember calling home to mom and dad and saying, I made a terrible decision, I got a transfer, I got a, I don't know, go to medical school, PT, I don't know podiatry, veterinary, and I'm telling this story to a young woman in the hallway in the sea annex in 1999. It was January of 1999, so 20 years ago. And she said, whoa, 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 before you do anything, before you drop out of school, go listen to this doctor speak on campus. He's an upper cervical doctor. His name is Russell Friedman. And like Many of you, I was a good soldier, and I went to a program like this, and Dr. Friedman didn't talk. He brought six of his patients who told these miraculous stories, and you'll hear a couple tonight. And like most of you, I was from Jersey, right? So I'm like, you got proven to me, you know? But I was open enough to go and become a patient. And for me, when I started under upper cervical care, I felt right again. For me, I knew that this had found me, and that this was what I was supposed to be doing for the rest of my life, and I was 20 years old at the time. And I said to Dr. Freeman, I said, can I just take your trash out, mentor from you? And like, I talked him into it, and I went there every Tuesday for three years, and I learned from this man. He was seeing patients from all over the world, he still does. And here we are now, 20 years later, 200,000 adjustments later, we've trained 10 doctors, we've helped thousands of people, and if that young girl in the hallway that day, or those six people don't come on that Wednesday night, who knows, none of us are in this room, and I'm clipping toenails as a podiatrist. Not that there's anything wrong with that. You never know how far reaching something you say today will affect the lives of millions of people tomorrow. I, to this day, don't know who that young girl is who shared this with me. She doesn't know the impact that it's had on, on, on my life. And so for those of you who have brought friends, Again, remember what I said? You just, first of all, for those of you who are patients and you brought somebody, can, can we just get a lot of round of applause? I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why you deserve a round of applause. It takes courage. It's a lot easier to say nothing. It's a lot easier for that girl to not tell me about this. It's a lot easier for Joe not to bring you to dinner back in the fall. And we know how much the care has changed your life. It's a lot easier. So I go on this quest to study and learn upper cervical. Now you know how we ended up here. And when I came back to New Jersey in 03, there were only two other upper cervical doctors in London, Central New Jersey. And the reason why the upper cervical adjustment can be so gentle is because there's a little bone under your skull. It's called the uh, atlas. atlas, thank you. And it's named after the Greek <coughs> god that held up the world. Greg. Oh. Greg. Greg, okay. He thinks he's a great guy. No ego in the room, though. <laughs> it's named after the Greek god that held up the world. It holds up your skull, your world. And what's really unique about the atlas is it's not locked in with those discs above and below. It has no disc. And it doesn't have these funny interlocking joints that the rest of your spine has. And the reason why it's designed like that is it's designed so that your neck can turn 180 degrees on the axis bone. 
180 degrees. So if you can't look over your shoulder, and you can't look over that shoulder, there's a good chance your atlas isn't moving the way that God and nature intended it to. The other reason why this area is so critical is because there's a hole in your head, your dad was right, you do have a hole in your head, it's on the bottom. It's called the foramen magnum, in case there's gonna be a test. And this is your mind-body connection. This is where your brain gets your spinal cord, it's called your brain stem. And there's 13 cranial nerves that come off of there, and they go into your head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat. And if there's a problem with any of your upper cervical nerves, it can affect your blood pressure, your anxiety, your mood. It can affect the way that your face feels. It can affect your balance or cause vertigo issues. It can cause headaches and migraines. It can cause facial pain, called trigeminal neuralgia, which we've had a lot of success helping. If you have problems in the lower cervical spine, the nerves that come out of there, they go down your arms. So that can be the numbness and tingling you feel occasionally, or hopefully never, um, in your hands when you're sleeping or when you wake up in the morning. The same nerves that go down your arms also go to your heart and lungs. That's why when someone's having a heart attack, they feel it in their arm. So if you feel something here, it's also affecting your heart and the way that it works. In the Journal of Neurosurgery, January 2017, volume 25, they said that a thoracic kyphosis is linked to mortality, length of life, because this compresses your heart, lungs, and stomach, causes the reflux, raises blood pressure, and this body doesn't live as long as this body. This is not about a bad back, guys. This is about your life and your health. If there's a problem in the thoracic spine, the nerves that come out of there will go to your stomach, your spleen, your pancreas, your liver, your gallbladder. Women around 40, their gallbladder starts not working right, and it has stones, and the doctors remove it, but they never look at the electrical connection that's telling the gallbladder how to work, and they don't tell the woman that your gallbladder has a function. God gave it to you to help you break down fat, and you will put on weight every year now for the rest of your life. There's nerves that come out of your low back. They go down your legs. Most people know about the sciatic nerve that goes down the leg and into the pinky toe. It can affect your balance. It can cause neuropathy if you have nerve interference there or subluxation there. It can also affect women, your cycles. It can affect men, your prostate. It can affect your bowel, your bladder. We've had patients that come in, men that come in for back pain and they pull me aside and they go, I didn't bring this up, but now things work better. Mm -hmm. Did you do something? I said indirectly. <laughs> and so these nerves go everywhere. They go everywhere. And doesn't it make sense, like if, you're, if your microwave isn't working and your dishwasher isn't working, your refrigerator isn't working, that you don't go get three new appliances, that you go, sweetie, can you check the fuse box in the garage? Mm -hmm. That's what we do. We check the fuse box in the garage. But I don't check all the little fuses. I just go to the main breaker, clonk, 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 which is right at the top. Well, to your neck doctor? No. If your doctor gives you a shot of medicine in your butt, he's not a butt doctor, right? <laughs> he's using that to get to the bloodstream. I told you I some dad jokes. They love those guys. Obviously, you haven't grown up either, which is great. Christopher Reeves falls off a horse on that fateful day, and he severs his spinal cord in C2. He didn't have a neck problem and a headache. He lost control of his legs, his breathing, and ultimately his life. Because that intelligence that animates life, that controls our body, the brain and the cord, could not communicate any longer. That was an extreme example of nerve interference or subluxation. What if you had pressure on your nervous system in the same area as Christopher Reeves, but to one one hundredth of a degree? Could it affect the way that you walk? Could it affect your legs? Could it affect your breathing? Could it affect your lungs? Could it affect your life? When's the first time we get a misalignment in the upper neck? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Birth. 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 Has anybody been born? <laughs> I know you don't remember it, but if you've been to a live birth, and for those of you who are patients, I've actually shown videos in the office, right? Because even in, a, even in uncomplicated vaginal birth, there's still a 180 degree turn of the neck to get the baby out. In a cesarean section, they can use 60 to 80 pounds of axial traction to get the baby out. That's equivalent to tying a 60 pound plate to an infant's ankles and picking up by the head. Now, if I handed you an infant, 
Everybody would be making sure that you support the head, support the head, support the head, because it's all floppy. So I know we don't remember being born, but we could have had our first misalignment there. And then we were learning, then we were putting these carriers like this. And then we were learning to walk, and we were going out, boom. My son, who, God bless him, is four years old, has already had uh, st uh, stitches in his face and staples in his head. Just, it, it happens. This stuff happens. And then you ever get out of the, then, then you go to school and you start with the book bags, and then there's computers and technology, then there's the car accident, then there's the sports injuries. You ever get out of the airplane seat and bump your head on the overhead? You ever try to reach into your car for your keys or your sunglasses and you come out and you hit the door jam? You ever miss a step and do one of these? Do you think that it's possible that you got to this point in your life and this bone that's not locked in that only weighs two ounces is not sitting right? And so what happens is there's no symptoms. You feel good. And the kids feel good. They don't know it either. My son, after he got the medical care, got stitched up and stapled up, like he didn't know his atlas was subluxated. His dad did. We took care of him. I'm not, no, let's wait until there's a, a symptom, and then we'll do something. Right? Well, that's what people do. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. How many people have tried to invite 10 other people to come tonight, and they said they're fine? Right? We talked about the pitcher who felt fine when he went out to play ball that day. So that subluxation, that misalignment is silent, it's asymptomatic. And what happens is, if you took an injury this way, you go this way. And if you took an injury, you go this way. And if you took this injury, you go this way. But there's one direction you can't go, into the ground. Because the ground's there. How do you go down? You can't go down. So what your body does is it turns. It turns. And it compresses. There's still no symptoms. It leads to a life of abnormal movement patterns progressive wear and tear, and then finally, years later, something hurts. It could be five years, it could be 15 years, it could be 50 years later. I consulted with a woman this week, they were in a car accident 50 years ago, and she was upside down in the parkway, and her symptoms are now, and her neck is collapsed. She had no symptoms until now. When's the best time to get checked? Well, now. now. <laughs> When's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. When's the second best time if you didn't plant it? Now. Who needs to get checked? People in pain, should they, or with a condition, should they get checked? Absolutely. What if you have no pain and no condition? Should you, what if you're old, should you get checked? What if you're young, should you get checked? So everybody should get checked. Just like we should get our teeth checked, and our eyes checked, and everything else checked. You should get your spine and your nervous system checked. It only controls and coordinates every organ, cell, and tissue of your body. So the body compresses downward, and then finally their disc <coughs> bulges or herniates. And now with the advent of MRI, you can actually see nerve pressure. If those of you have had a cervical or a lumbar MRI, and you look at your spinal cord and you see that it does this, that's nerve pressure. On the worst, the most important nerve, the cord. And the inventor of the MRI unit, Dr. Ray Demadian, who invented the MRI unit, he just invented video MRI about seven years ago. And he started working with a copper cervical colleague of mine. This is the inventor of the MRI unit. And they start putting MS patients, Parkinson's patients, and ALS patients. Happy birthday. Is that you, Rob? Happy birthday. That's the first time that we've gotten to do that. That's awesome. Thank you, Rob. So he starts putting these patients in the video MRI. And in 100% of the cases, you can see the cerebral spinal fluid is not coming in and out of the brain right now. And it backs up, and it can cause plaquing on the brain. He came out and said the underlying cause of MS, Parkinson's, ALS, and CTE, right, the condition that the NFL players are getting, is an uncorrected cervical trauma misalignment. And on average, there's 11 years between the trauma and the first symptom, and that's why the neurologists are missing the diagnosis. They then do an upper cervical adjustment and put them in the video MRI, and you see the brain change and the flow change instantly. It's the most powerful thing I know. And so by the time you have pain going down your arm and down your leg, and you go to the orthopedic, and they go to the MRI, and they go, it's that one, it's C5, C6, the disc herniated. It's part of aging. How old's the other one? Above it or below it? How many of your friends have had a hip replaced? And they go, oh, it's part of aging. Well, how old's the other hip? Did it need it? Why does one hip go before the other? One knee go before the other? C5 go before C6? It's all mechanics. You drive on that car out of balance for long enough, one tire falls before the other. 
it's awesome for orthopedic surgeons. I mean, they're doing hips and knees and hips and knees. But what if someone just checked the balance and the alignment early? Maybe we preserve these joints. Or if we're so focused on treating the pain in the nerve and nobody's looking, I promise you, if you've gotten x-rays or MRIs at an orthopedic office, they look at either your neck or your back. That would be like going to the dentist and they just take x-rays of your front two teeth. It's so ridiculous that you laugh, Lynn, that this is an organ. The top affects the bottom, the bottom affects the top. If I hit the back of your car, the front of the car moves too. You can never correct your cervical spine without looking at the lumbar, and you can never correct your lumbar spine without looking at the cervical. It's one unit. And if they laid you down for your images on one of those tables and put you into a tube, it tells you that they know nothing about biomechanics because you don't live laying down, you live standing up. And if you want to know how the gravity is affecting the body, you got to look at it standing up, and that's why we take full spine x-rays so we can see the damage and misalignment. And we're the only people in spinal care, the only people in spinal care, looking at the initial trauma of the body. I can look at you, Dr. Neville can look at you from behind, and we can see the trauma. And you can see it right now. What's out of alignment? The whole thing's out of alignment. And do we want to push into this system with an adjustment? No. We want to release it. God made your spine like a can of soda. It can withstand gravity. You can push that on a can, and even Atlas over there couldn't crush it. But if you twist the can just a bit, it compresses. And this is what happens with the spine, guys. Can you bring back a fire? A fire. This is what happens with the spine, guys. It just compresses down. Now, if you're under our care, I gotta take it off right. If you're under our care, and we do an adjustment to the upper neck, we can release the entire column, like letting a jack-in-the-box out of the box, like that, decompress it. Now, will this Coke can ever be perfect again? Will it ever be as good as Coca-Cola made in Atlanta? No, there's always gonna be damage and a wrinkle. Always gonna be damage and a wrinkle. But I promise you, this becomes this, becomes this, becomes this, and we have a saying in our office that grandma never gets taller. When do you want to intervene? It's the only adjustment that I know in chiropractic, and I've studied many of them, that removes compression out of the spine, it goes back to the original trauma. That's what makes it different. And the beautiful thing is, because I'm 180 pounds, Dr. Winkle's really strong and has big muscles, we don't have to use a lot of force to move a two ounce vertebrae. It's a very gentle contact along the side of your neck to release the spine. It's almost unbelievable. <laughs> And it's a full spine adjustment all through the upper neck. So it's not a neck adjustment, guys. It's a spine adjustment. And the purpose of the adjustment is to remove pressure off of the nervous system so that your body can do what it's intended to do, just like the thermostat can do what it's intended to do. So that's it. That's what we do. That's why we do it. That's who we are. But you don't want to just 